Greetings, I'd like to begin this video by making the statement that this video is not primarily intended for atheists, agnostics, skeptics, people who don't believe in God, people who think that Christians are retards and so on. If that's you, I've got other messages for you today, uh, but this is not one of them. You can safely press the pause button on YouTube and go and look at something else because we're starting with totally different presuppositions. I'm actually going to address people who believe that the Bible is the Word of God, who believe that the Scriptures are an accurate record of who God is and what He's about on the earth. And uh, recently, of course, I've been getting some flack from people, Christians included, regarding my questions and observations concerning the recent tragedy, very sad tragedy in Christchurch with the earthquake. And of course, there are many other disasters that are happening in the world, but we get a little more shocked when it happens in a Western nation. In any case, I want to take a look at the scriptures and identify who is this God who is talking here. And uh, I think it's good for us to look at it and ask ourselves, is this the same God that we know? I'm looking at the book of Nahum today, and here it begins in chapter 1, verse 2. God is jealous and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry and dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither and the flower of Lebanon wilts. The mountains quake before him, the hills melt, and the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation and who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. I want to ask you, do you know who this scripture is talking about? It's actually talking about our God. It's talking about the God of the Bible, Yahweh, Jehovah, the one who says, I am the Lord, I change not. I want to show in due course that indeed the scriptural record makes it abundantly clear that God has not changed. There is a side to God which a lot of people aren't comfortable with because basically in our philosophy in the last few hundred years we've become humanists. We think that the universe is all about us, our happiness, and what we like. And if God doesn't fit into that, well, we'll vote him out. And uh, we'll change the doctrine, we'll change the message to accommodate for ourselves and make for ourselves a God that we do like, a God who's only uh, into grace, mercy, all forgiving, all loving, and so on and so forth. A God who, when people spit in his face and when people mock him, reject him, and persecute his servants, that he's quite cool with that too. A God who's quite happy for you to be indulging in all your favorite fantasies and all your uh, entertainments, etc. That's the kind of God that many people want. A God who's all about you feeling good. Well, let's see if it's the same God as mentioned here. God is jealous and the Lord avenges. So our God is actually a God who said the first commandment, which is, you shall have no other gods before me. So God is jealous. He doesn't like it when people bow down and worship other gods. Now, we may not be so unsophisticated today as to bow down to images of gold and silver, but if we're bowing down to money and making it our priority, then we're definitely idolaters and we're in that category. If we're friends with the world, the Bible says, friendship with the world is enmity with God, James 4. So. If you're in that category, God calls you an adulteress and God is jealous. And it says the Lord avenges. It says the Lord avenges again. It repeats itself and is furious. There's an anger in God, a righteous anger, which not many people talk about, but it's there in the scripture. I wonder if that's your God. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. And he reserves wrath for his enemies. Now the Bible says that friendship with the world is enmity with God. If anyone makes himself a friend of the world, he's an enemy of God. If you're an enemy of God, 
God will take vengeance on you according to this scripture. The Lord reserves wrath for his enemies. He will take vengeance on his enemies. Does that sound comforting? I don't think it's very comforting, but we need to know who we're dealing with. When we really understand who we're dealing with, then we'll really appreciate the offer of mercy that's in the gospel. But I feel that this offer of mercy is despised, it's rejected by people who feel that God owes everything to them and they owe nothing to God. It says here, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. That means he might hold off for a year, 10 years, 30 years, 50 years before executing judgment and justice upon a rebellious, backslidden and idolatrous nation of people, group of people. If a group of people, if a nation is at one time a God-fearing nation and then turns away from God, I think these nations are special candidates for God's vengeance. Because after God has pleaded, after God has wooed, after God has sent prophets and teachers to urge people to repent, and it's all despised, and we don't want to hear it, we only want to hear false teachers and false prophets, false evangelists telling us that all is well, that God is cool with everything we're doing, and, uh, and all that, and he's not angry at all. Well, you know, it's another God. It's not the God of the Bible. God is slow to anger. It, just because he might take 10, 20, 30 years before he pours out his wrath upon a people, a city, or a place, doesn't mean he's not feeling that he's being wronged. He's very patient, but after a while, he has the right to express his anger and wrath. It happens from time to time. And it's very, very tragic when it happens because it happens when God sees no other way to get the attention of people. It says he will not at all acquit the wicked. So if you're practicing wickedness, you can call yourself a born again Christian. But if you're practicing sin, if you're deliberately going after the things that God condemns, God won't declare you righteous. Have a read of 1 John and find out who God will declare righteous and who he won't declare righteous. It's very instructive. And perhaps you've been deceived along these lines. It says, the Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. God is in these storms. Recently we had major storms in Queensland. And I believe there was a measure of mercy in the midst of these storms. People prayed and God averted the worst of what could have been. Still houses were wiped out. Still a lot of damage was done to the economy. Very little life was lost in, those, uh, in some of those accidents. There were some lives lost in the floods, but very few compared to the whole scheme of things. I don't know if you realize, but 155,000 people die every day. So if one or two people die, if 50 people die, it's a blip on the screen. And we ought to ask ourselves, are we ready to die? Because it can happen at any time. I think what people don't like about these disasters is people assume they have a God-given right to live a long life, uh, to live a secure life, that the earth's going to stay in its place, that the waters won't rise up too much. They can pretty much count on 70 years if they don't drink, don't smoke, uh, eat fairly well, exercise, you know, live a good life. And when life is cut short suddenly without warning, people freak out. Well, God has not promised anybody a tomorrow. It's been a cliche in the past, but I think it's becoming more real today as we really look at what's going on in the world. People say God's not in the storm, God's not in the whirlwind, but the scripture says here, the Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. The clouds are the dust of his feet. We're not talking about some minor deity. We're talking about Almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, who rules over the elements who upholds every atom by the word of his power, and without whom no sparrow can fall to the ground. It says he rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. God causes droughts. And it goes on, the mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves at his presence. People say, well, God's not in these earthquakes. Well, it says the earth heaves at his presence. That means the Lord's there when it's happening. And uh, we're talking about a sovereign God here that a lot of people don't know. You don't know him. 
if you think that he doesn't have any anger and vengeance upon people who refuse to hear his word again and again. It says, who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the fierceness of his anger? Is this the God you know? His fury is poured out like fire. And the rocks are thrown down by him. This is one side of the Lord God's character that many people don't emphasize. I want you to think a little bit about the scriptures that talk about eternal judgment just for a moment. Now, again, it's become popular amongst uber cool Christian pastors in certain quarters to deny the reality of hell, never to preach on it, and to say things like, well, all people will eventually be saved. Now, I'm not here to address that topic. However, the scriptures talk a lot about the anger and vengeance of God and a place called hell. Just imagine this, 155,000 people died yesterday. Of those, let's suppose that only half went to hell. I think it's a lot more than that. But So 75,000 people have now entered hell. They're burning. They're screaming in agony. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. The worms are crawling through their spiritual being. They're tormented in flames. You think God didn't arrange this? God has arranged this for all his enemies, those who worship other gods, those who refuse to repent, those who do not believe the gospel and do not obey the gospel. The Bible says God will punish them with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. That's what it says in 2 Thessalonians 1, about verse 8. Do you believe in that God who ordains such things? Or have you found another one? Let me tell you something. Everyone's so upset when God sends a warning in the form of an earthquake or something like that. An earthquake is nothing compared to what's happening every day to the lost. The people who are dying, the people who are without God and without hope in this world, according to the scriptures. God has commanded us as Christians to preach the good news to all creation. And there's a reason for it. People are in desperate need of good news because of these realities that exist. People are in desperate need of the mercy of God. They don't know it. And the church represents it as kind of a casual affair. No big deal. Take it or leave it. Jesus said, compel them to come in. Now in this message, I haven't preached the gospel at all. But what I've tried to do is show you one side of God's character, that he is a God of vengeance and he will not acquit the wicked. Well, people say God's not in natural disasters. Or perhaps they say that was the Old Testament. Everything changed since the cross. Have you read the book of Revelation? Have you read the book of Revelation? All the judgments that came upon the earth. And as they came, men would not give up worshipping demons. And they cursed the God of heaven. And I see it today, even with uh, atheists, but also with Christians who are angry at me for saying, for daring to suggest that God may be judging the world through some of these natural disasters that are going on. You see the anger at the thought, how dare God do anything that's not for our happiness? How dare he expect people to obey him and follow him and treat him with respect? How dare he? Doesn't he know who we are? We're human beings. We've got it all upside down, friend. He's the creator. We're the created ones. We owe him everything. Every drink of water, every breath of air we should thank God for. Because we certainly didn't create the air and we certainly didn't create the water. We didn't create our own minds, our own brains. Everything we have is a gift from Almighty God. If we refuse to worship him and serve him and treat him with honor and respect, we are committing a terrible sin. And the Bible says that God will not acquit the wicked. So be very careful when you start making declarations that are against the scripture. Be very careful when you start declaring a God of your own imagination, a popular God. This is a kind of God that doesn't exist.